Welcome to Gold Silver Pros. Hey everybody, this is Rob Keenson with Gold Silver Pros, and this is your weekly edition of the weekly market wrap up. We sort of adjusted our schedule this week because we had a lot of stuff going on. Uh, first, at the beginning of the week, we wanted to do a tribute to Jim Forsyth uh, because of all the contributions he's made to the Precious Metals community. If you haven't seen Tuesday's video, please go take a look at it. Uh, and we've moved back the weekly market wrap this week to accommodate our, our schedule here at the shop. I'm busy building a new studio here in the shop. It's taken longer than I would have wanted it to, but we're going to have a new studio up, which you guys will see in, in the coming weeks that we're going to broadcast from. It'll be similar quality to what we used to have uh, back in my home office when I ran it. So that's coming pretty soon. But this is just a transition couple of weeks for us as we kind of get things ready and, and new updates and changes coming to the channel. So with all that said, we're going to get to it. And I've got a lot to talk about this week. Um, there's a lot going on. We're going to start with the economic calendar. We'll start right off with what happened last week. The major uh, data points for you to know is the uh, NFIB optimism index, which is just an indication of how optimistic people are about the economy has fallen. It's below expectations of 90.2 on the index. It came in at 89.4 and that 89.4 was lower than last month's 89.9. So optimism overall for the economy was starting to trend down up until the Fed announcement that they're going to cut rates this year in 2024, three cuts. And we'll get to that in a minute. That'll be one of our big stories. The consumer price index, of course, is up. We've got a 3.2% inflation. I think that's the second or third straight month that we've seen an increase in inflation. I've been saying for several months now that we would see an increase in inflation in 2024. This would be the second wave of the, of the inflation and maybe what will turn out to be a three cycle uh, inflation uh, sort of progression like we've had in the past. If it follows like the 70s, 80s. Uh, trend or, you know, it could be a little bit different this time, but we're definitely back into inflation now. And that was big news. Uh, also, a lot of the manufacturing has really started to come down. The Empire State Manufacturing Survey continues to crash. It was a negative 2.4 uh, last month. Now it's a negative 20.9. So back in the Northeast and in New York and the Northeast area, manufacturing is not doing so well. And there are a lot of different regional surveys on manufacturing, but all of the manufacturing that I'm seeing all the statistics indicate that we are not making anything right now. Uh, and indeed, the industrial production survey came in at 0.1% positive, which looks nice, except for the fact when you consider inflation or prices and things, it doesn't really mean much. We're not really growing our production or inflation or capacity utilization, which is a measure of how much we're producing as a percentage of our ability to produce as, as a nation as a whole is sitting at 78.3%, the same as last month. But that means that we have almost 22 percent slack in our economy where we're not producing or making things, whether it be the service based economy or the manufacturing part of the economy and growing, you know, our total sort of share of the pie and growing our economy. We are actually have been shrinking. And that's what these statistics have been indicating, regardless of what the stock market is telling you. And I'll get to the stock market here in a moment. The Home Builder Confidence Index finally tipped up into positive territory with an index value of 51, which is very slightly positive after the forecast was for a 48 and previous month was a 48 as well. So a little bit of confidence in home builders, mostly because they think that rates are going to come down uh, with the Fed rate cuts and that more people are going to be able to buy houses. Although we're already, we've already progressed into uh, the area of housing affordability based on higher loan rates and higher prices where people, the average person can't afford it. So home prices have to come way, way down for people to be able to afford it. But short term, there's a little bit more optimism. I don't think that really means anything in the long run. Housing starts have ticked up and building permits have ticked up in the past month. But that doesn't mean that that real estate's going to finish and that people will actually be able to buy it. And I think the ability of consumers to buy it, given higher interest rates and given how much debt that they have, uh, means that those numbers won't stay positive for long. Initial jobless claims is holding steady in the 210,000 range. It's been the same for the last few months. Going back to manufacturing, Philadelphia Fed manufacturing survey actually went negative, negative 3.2, which is about eight and a half points lower than last month. Uh, and the PMI, uh, the measure of purchasing manager index of, of where uh, uh, people that create things and, and their expectations for the economy have also been trending down. So the, the S&P flash or the short term U.S. services PMI has fallen from 52.3 on the index last month to 51.7. So overall, the indicators are uh, from the data points that the economy continues to trend down, even though the stock market's up. So let's talk about the stock market. The Fed, our big story of the week, is talking about 
cutting interest rate three times in 2024, although it seems like they're going to backload them for the second half of the year. They haven't committed to any short term rate cuts. They wanted to see what happens with inflation. The Fed is very well aware of inflation. In fact, they've moved their target rate from 2% inflation to 2.8% because, as I've stated many times, structural inflation caused by excess money printing, which caused inflation of the money supply, means that we're going to have structural inflation, whether or not we go into deflation in terms of economic output. So how does that work? Well, you've had so much money creation and so much de-dollarization from around the world that all of those dollars, colloquially called euro dollar accounts, even though those dollars don't have to be in Europe, they could be anywhere. Any foreign dollar bank account or, or holding is called a euro dollar account. That money is starting to come back to the U.S. as, as the rest of the world de-dollarizes. So we're getting inflation. It's a reverse of what happened before. We would export our dollar inflation to the rest of the world. Now we're getting that inflation back. And so we're having inflation in prices, even though our economic output is shrinking and the rest of the world's economic output is shrinking. So for years, the debate uh, has been in the economic space, are we going to have inflation or deflation? And I've always argued we would have both. We'll have a deflation of economic output, but because of the money supply finally rearing its head and showing up in the economy, we're going to have an inflation of prices at the same time. We're also going to have an inflation of prices because commodity prices are going up because we haven't invested enough in the commodities complex and it's getting harder to find resources. Not only precious metals, but any sort of resources, any sort of metal uh, farming has gotten more expensive. So uh, inputs into our economy are more expensive, even though we're producing less. And because we're producing less, that's going to negatively affect availability of goods. So we're going to have inflation of prices, even though economic output is coming down. And I've said this for 15 years. People thought I was nuts, but that's exactly what we're seeing in the data right now. Period of story. It is irrefutable. All right, moving on to some of the markets, we're going to talk about Bitcoin and bonds. I want to talk about Bitcoin here for a minute. It's up now to 62,880, actually down 20, almost 2,500 on the day. At the time I'm reporting this, about what is it, about 10 o'clock in the morning central time, Bitcoin's down. So when you see this, it may be different, but Bitcoin's come off of, I think it was around 70, 71,000 at one point, uh, a little bit of cooling because of, I think, because of the Fed announcement. And the Fed announcement that they're going to cut rates and basically go back into an easing cycle as the traditional market enthused and euphoric. And we're in the euphoria stage I've been talking about for the longest time. And that just essentially means that people have this belief that things are going to continue going or that like they've been going the last 15 years. And so some of these alternative assets like Bitcoin and gold and silver are starting to sell off. I don't think that that's long term. I think that that is a temporary correction, both Bitcoin and the precious metals, which we'll get uh, to here in a moment. Treasuries are still trading elevated, though. The two year, even though it's come down today, 0.039 points, it's still sitting at 4.593, almost 4.6 percent. And that, you know, as the Treasury has to roll over trillions of dollars of debt, I think the Treasury has to roll over at least one trillion coming up in the next month or two. And then a couple more trillion uh, in the next six to nine months, if I remember correctly, from from looking at the, the, the Treasury due dates, uh, the U.S. Treasury has to roll that debt over and they're rolling it from a lower interest rate to a higher interest rate. So the debt service is starting to increase for existing debt that's being rolled over in the United States. And that's the problem when you have higher interest rates. It causes even older debt when you roll it over and you don't pay it off because the U.S. government cannot pay off that $34 trillion of debt. Because they can't pay it off, they have to roll it over when it, it basically expires into a new issuance and that new issuance gets a higher interest rate. So you're taking the same debt burden that you had before, but you're adding a higher interest rate to it. And now it's more expensive for the government even to maintain its existing debt. And that's what we see the problem with the existing interest rates. And it's we're starting to roll over trillions of debt now. And so it's trillions of debt that this in higher interest rate is sitting on, which is really going to start to bankrupt the U.S. government because they're not going to have the ability to essentially pay for this. And that's why you see all these new taxes being introduced and confiscations of assets and the IRS hiring a bunch of new people is they've got to get more money from the people. They got to do it in, in terms of higher taxes, which was in the Biden uh, budget plan. They've got to do it in terms of reducing tax cuts. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, I think, was uh, talking about uh, raising a tax on the ultra rich to get more money. So uh, communism, socialism is uh, progressing very strongly in America. The confiscation of assets through inflation and taxation is starting to increase. And it, it, it's doing that because of all the bills we haven't paid and the higher interest rates with which we have to pay these bills and the American public's going to be on the hook for it. And you guys are going to be on the hook for it. So all of this debt's going to create a debt slavery system where people that can't even make ends meet now are going to be even more debt slaves as they're on the hook for all of this debt. And through the inflation continues to destroy their existing wealth or their existing store of dollars because dollars are becoming less valuable. Now the dollar had index has ticked up, but that's just relative to other currencies. And that's because of the news of the Fed saying, 
that they're going to do rate cuts, but the overall strength of the dollar from its purchasing power perspective continues to plummet and just get slammed. And overall, the bond complex, uh, 10 years are sitting at 4.218. It's just too expensive. And we're still in that yield curve inversion, which is predicting a recession. I think that's still uh, going to happen. Now I wanted to get into the stories of the week, and I'm going to share with you a story from Mish Talk talking about what's going on with the war. And I think this is uh, huge. Uh, I've been talking about the war quite a bit. I haven't talked about it probably as much the last couple of weeks, but I wanted to talk about it here. So this is an article talking about the European Council president calling on Europe to switch to a war economy. Uh, as a way to create jobs, EC President Charles Michel promotes a war economy. Where that would, would lead is obvious. Uh, here, according to your intelligence, uh, is a little excerpt from Michel's rosy war economy. What Michel wants concretely is EU targets to buy twice as much weapons from European defense producers by 2030, to use the profits from Russian frozen assets to finance weapons purchases for Ukraine, to facilitate financial access for European defense industry, in, uh, including by issuing a European defense bond and getting the European Investment Bank to add defense purposes to its lending criteria. Michel sells it, uh, it to us as a way to create jobs and growth. It is to provide more clarity to companies with multi-annual defense contracts to increase their capacity. And by investing in defense industry, the EU is boosting its technology and innovation, a, conf a confident Michelle reassures us. I want to translate that for you right now. The economy is crashing. They want to keep the economy going, but they want to move dollars into, into defense. It's going to enrich the defense companies, but it's also setting up for a new war. And I don't, I've long suspected we're heading into World War III. I talked about it. Uh, very explicitly last year in my experience with being in a military college for my master's and the discussions that we had internally there, you know, on college campus for residency week. And the fact that everybody there knew that we were eventually going to World War III and it was a lot closer than we thought. And it was a very serious conversation. Well, now you're seeing it overtly in the press about how Europe is gearing up for war with Russia. So this uh, Ukraine war was just a proxy. We're headed into a larger war. And uh, again, um, I think it was Putin that came out uh, or uh, his government basically came out this week and said, if uh, European Union or the U.S. sends its troops into the Ukraine war, he'll use tactical nukes. So it doesn't seem like Russia is backing down off of that. I don't know if we're going to go to nuclear war. It's very clear that we're eventually going to go to some sort of ground based war based upon what the European Commission, the European politicians, the European Union currently wants to do. And they're gearing up for that. They're changing their whole economy into a wartime economy. It's very clear the writing on the wall is what's coming. And you could say it's insanity and you don't think it's going to happen. But if you're changing your entire European economy to gear up for war, I think that's a pretty serious indication of where we're going. And if you're not paying attention to this now, you're lost and I can't help you. OK, I'm, I'm to the point of if you can't see you, if you can't read the tea leaves now, I, I can't help you at this point. Um, I can only broadcast the news. You guys have got to figure out what you're going to do. And I'm not you know, I'm not going to coddle anybody anymore on this channel about what's going on. I'm just going to call it like I see it. Continuing the quote here from the article, what Michelle talks about is not a European Union, which uh, we recognize anymore, nor one that will work in practice, quoted from the article. Perhaps that would be Vladimir Putin's greatest triumph that he changed the DNA of our union. The attempt to base economic integration, economic stimulus on defense creates precedents. If we build up a defense industry, the article reads, we need conflicts to feed them. Beyond Ukraine, will we do the same for Georgia? Would we want our economy to depend on wars in Africa to prop up our GDP growth data? If the U.S. decides to retreat, does that mean we need to pick up where the U.S. left off? Michelle wants a geopolitical Europe, the article states, and finishes his letter with the familiar Cold War phrase that if you want peace, you need to prepare for war. This is not a Cold War, but a hot war in Ukraine. Are those weapons in Michelle's war economy to speak for our failures in diplomacy? What is our historic contribution to the conflict? Should we not start from there, the article asks. The language Michelle uses is dramatic and dangerous. Some of our older citizens still remember what it means to live in a war economy. Michelle's loose talk is disrespectful, and it is insincere to suggest that we need a war economy to help Ukraine. He focuses on the bright side of the war, the solidarity that EU shows with Ukraine, the economic growth that could come from an increasingly thriving defense economy. Michelle is deliberately ignoring the dark side of the war and the many tough life and death decisions to be taken. Just look at Israel to see where this has gone. And again, uh, breaking from the article for a moment, my commentary, I warned everybody about what was going on in the Gaza Strip, that it was going to accelerate into a larger Mideast war. And not that I'm smarter than everybody else, but I'm just reading the tea leaves of what's going on. And the response from the other Arab nations, not only terroristic organizations, but just regular, um, you know, Arab leaders 
And, um, you know, now we're in conflict with the Houthi. We're in Syria. We're in Yemen. It's all over the place now. And now we have two wars going on. We have Eastern Europe and Russia, and now we have the Middle East. And if anybody doesn't think that these can't, either one of these powder cakes can't blow up, they can. And going back to the talk we had at the college, in my master's level, when we went to residency, these are the two areas that we're talking about starting World War III. Well, guess what we're having? We're having these two areas blow up. Again, I can't tell you what date it's going to happen or whether it's definitely going to happen, but it's clear that the leadership in both um, Israel, the United States, and in the West, uh, in Europe, as represented by Europe and the European Union, is, is preparing for war multiple hot wars here and they're changing their economy again i think it's pretty clear where this is going last part of the article quoting again is michelle acting alone or is he building a case for leaders like emmanuel macron for the next european parliament macron recently talked about european troops in ukraine in a defense union we think this loose and uncoordinated talk is careless it gives rise to fear narratives that the public is not in position to judge within a rational framework it does not solve the more fundamental disagreements amongst european countries either then there is a European Parliament, which is expected to swing further to the right after the elections in June. We have to resist the temptation to reduce our policy options to defense only. Europe will need a lot more in terms of diplomacy, especially, to become a geopolitical player in its own right. Again, a lot going on with the war front. Wanted to uh, bring you up to that, and I've got another story here. Uh, I'm going to talk about what's going on in the United States, especially what's happening at our border. This is a good uh, post on Twitter from Jenny Tear. And her quote on the, the Twitter post, quote, this is the moment where Texas National Guard became overrun by migrants rioting to get across the border here in El Paso today. We were there and saw it all happen. Absolute chaos here. We're not going to have audio for the video. You really don't need it, but I'm going to show you the video. The migrants basically push down a fence, one fence, and get to the second fence. So what's happening is there's so many migrants and not enough uh, border patrol, not enough National Guard to keep them from forcing their way into the country. And so now what you have is a, it's it's not only a policy issue with uh, the the issue that's going on between Washington and Texas with regards to the border. It's becoming a physical issue where even if Texas wants to enforce a border, it's having trouble. And so now uh, it looks like Texas in the southwest the United States is being overrun by immigrants now, because I guarantee you this is also happening in, in the other three states of border, Mexico, New Mexico, Arizona and California. And while Texas is trying to hold ground, our resources are literally being overrun. So I don't care where you are in the United States. If you're living in the United States, these, these migrants, they get IDs and they get driver's licenses and they get things like that and they spread out all over. So these people are coming to your communities. Not all of them are looking to do harm. Some of them are innocents just looking for a better life. But a lot of them in reality are essentially um, uh, dangerous. They're criminals. They're gang members. They're not even from uh, Middle or South America or Mexico. A lot of them are in being imported from the Middle East and from other areas, and, and a lot of them have been shown by Border Patrol and law enforcement to have ties to uh, uh, militant groups and terrorism. And this is now just invading our country. And for those that saw this happen in Europe, now it's happening in the US, it's very dangerous. And if and if we don't do something about this, this is gonna come to a neighborhood near you. It's not just me in Texas that's worried about my own defense of my family, my own safety. This is coming to you. So I don't care where you're watching this from, this is coming to a community near you. Look at the video and watch what's going on right now on your border right now, which is going to come to your neighborhood before you know it. But eventually migrants just break through here and there's a guy at the secondary fence, the bigger fence, he's like, get back, but he can't do anything. And the guard can't do anything short of shooting these people, and they don't want to do that. You don't want to murder a lot of the innocents are in here. Yes, they're breaking law by coming across, but eventually you're going to have to make a choice whether we shoot these people. But either shoot them or maybe lob tear gas or whatever you're going to do. At some point, you're going to have to get physical with these people because they're getting physical with the Border Patrol now. Well, something more is going on. We're going to relate this to precious metals because we're going to talk about precious metals basically for the rest of the program. Here's a nice article from Shift Gold on Zero Hedge about how the BLM is waging war on precious metals. And this is something I talked about on, I believe, a couple of other podcasts I was on and other channels. I'm going to bring it to this channel today, talking about how the government can reduce the amount of supply, not only of precious metals, but base metals to squeeze the economy and force people into certain decisions. So let's, let's look at this article from uh, Shift Gold here on Zero Hedge. Quote, 
The Bureau of Land Management is a federal agency that controls 245 million acres of land and controls 30% of the country's mineral resources. On the East Coast, it manages little land, but manages an enormous share of Western states. It owns over two thirds of Nevada. This gives the federal government enormous sway over the West. Want to go hunting? Want to start a logging company? Want to go hiking? Better make sure it's okay with the government first. The BLM does allow the public and businesses to use some of its land. That's the law. The BLM is supposed to accommodate energy production, outdoor recreation, and conservation. One of the uses that the BLM, BLM allows is gold mining. According to the GAO, billions of dollars worth of gold are mined from these lands annually. The status quo is quite favorable for mining of gold and some other precious metals like silver, lithium, and copper because the miners are not required to pay royalties to the federal government, which owns the land the resources are extracted. This is in contrast with fossil fuel extraction on public land where energy companies are required to pay royalties. But recent moves by the Biden administration, according to the article, uh, Biden administration bureaucrats in charge of BLM suggest that the administration is taking aim at precious metals production and might cut off the supply of precious metals from precious land. The BLM and the broader Biden administration are doing this in two ways. And I'm going to summarize. First, uh, quoted from the article, Biden has designated more and more land as national monuments. And when they're national monuments, you can't dig on it. And second, the other step the BLM is pursuing that might cut off precious metals production is the proposal of the innocuously named public lands rule. The rule, according to the article, which the BLM plans to soon implement, would, uh, and I'm going to highlight where I'm reading here in case you want to read along. And let me make this just a wee bit bigger for you guys so you can read it. Let's make this bigger so you guys can see it right here. The second step, the BLM is pursuing it might cut off precious metals production is a proposal of the innocuously named public lands rule. Of course, they always innocuously name it. They don't want you to know what it actually is. Going back to the article, quote, the rule which the BLM plans to soon implement would, in the BLM's own words, ensure that the BLM can respond to these pressures, managing for healthy lands today so that it can deliver its multiple use mission now and in the future to ensure the health, diversity and productivity of public lands for the use and enjoyment present of future generations. In other words, we want it to be used for recreation and other things, but not for production. And remember what I said when I was talking about what's going on in the economy with with. Uh, production going down, manufacturing going down, capacity utilization sitting 22% off of where we could be. The productive capacity of the nation is being strangled by inflation and the dollar killing businesses, but it's also being strangled because we're not able to net use the natural resources we have. So a lot of people have always said, American re can remain independent because of our own natural resources uh, and our own military. Well, the military is all fighting wars and I don't think they could defend the US right now in a conventional war unless they brought them all back. And then that will cause collapses around other places in the world which is a problem when you get embroiled with the military. But the bigger issue is the fact that we're not being allowed to use our own natural resources to build up our own economy. So the ability of us to recover from the coming crash is being strangled right now by the federal government and their policies around public land use. So we're going to have a hard time even recovering from this. And all that's going to do is further the length of time that we're in a crash period or a crisis period because we're not able to turn around and use what we have here at home to rebuild. So not only does uh, has uh, the government, along with the Fed, ruined the economy through dollar inflation and caused us, to, you know, to be set up for this big crash. But they're also going to make it near impossible for us to recover from it in any reasonable length of time because we can't use the resources that we have at our disposal. And that's a very dangerous route to go. But that's the route that they're going. And that's something that you guys need to be aware of. All right. On to the gold. As of time uh, that I'm recording this, gold's trading at 21.7094. Uh, after reaching an all-time high in the 2200s, I think it's 2240, somewhere around there. Silver came back down to 2474 after being above 25. You can see on the charts, uh, right around the 20th, silver was trading at almost 2580, about 2570 something, and gold was sitting at about 2205 or, or some somewhere along there. All new all-time highs in gold. Silver finally responded and got up off the mat and pushed through that critical 2450 support level and the $25 support level. And as we go through 30, there are a bunch of support levels. But once we get through 30 and move to 40 and 50, there are very little support levels. So what has to happen is they have to keep the prices below 25, 27, 30 so that uh, it looks like normal trading and that there's resistance. And so the, the silver can't pop because when silver pops, it's all over. The ability of the COMEX to manage uh, the international precious metal markets is over once silver finally pops. It's not gold, just gold that's going to do it. It's going to be gold and silver. So this price is being managed, and we'll get into the COT report here in a moment, but let's go over the volume. So we always do every week. I look at the volume. A lot of people come into my store, and they don't understand where prices are created. They think it's all physical trade. I'm like, no, the derivative market. So a lot of you guys have been coming into my store and talking to me. Uh, I promised you I would go over this, and, and I do every week on how this market works and listen to how it works. 
Most of this is paper trading. So look at the fact that we had about 550,000 contracts of open interest total across all the different months on the market. And these are futures paper contracts, but look at deliveries. Deliveries on $316,000 of contracts trading in June and 550,000 contracts trading overall for all months. There were only six deliveries. Um, and this data was through Thursday. So yesterday's data, we had six physical deliveries across 550,000 contracts. What's that percentage? Six divided by 550,000. Is it something like a thousandth of 1%, a millionth of 1%? I'm not even going to do the math. The physical deliveries have bupkis to do with the price. It's all the paper trading and it's right here on the website for you to see. So everybody that comes in or that emails me or that talks on social media, the spot price and dealers and wholesalers and the industry and miners and blah, 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 all the opinions that you have, you have to understand this is where the price is controlled, not anywhere else. And it has nothing to do with the miners. It has nothing to do with the dealers and the wholesalers and the mentors and any of that stuff with regards to production of the metals. It has to do with the fact that there were only six deliveries against 550,000 contracts. The price has bupkis to do with the actual physical supply and demand of the metals. And if you don't see that, again, I can't help you. And I'm not babying anybody anymore. It's there. It is what it is. If you argue with it, in my, my opinion, you're probably a moron. And at this point, I don't even care. I would be very expressive about that. Um, there, there are a lot of misinformation going on in the gold and silver industry and the commodities industry in general, and we need to start fighting it. There's a lot of garbage information out there that's being promulgated in a lot of different places, not only mainstream, but, but in social media. And that's something that, that we need to educate people properly on how this all works so that they know how it works, so that they can prepare themselves. And prices are artificially being held low now, which I'll show you in a minute on the COT report. And if you want to get precious metals, if that's something you want to do, contact your financial advisor. I'm not your financial advisor. Do your own research, blah, 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 blah. Disclaimer. But if you have decided to get into precious metals, my recommendation then is to do it now because I'm going to show you how they're suppressing it. But that's not going to last forever because we're running out of them. And with the U.S. restricting production of its own precious minerals and base metals that go along with that in these mines, not only through permitting, but designating public lands and doing all that kind of stuff. Where in the hell are you going to get it? You're not going to be able to get it if you don't get it now. So why in the fucking hell are you waiting? Let's just put it that way. All right, moving on. So if we look at the trade data, uh, June is now the dominant month for gold. Uh, 157,000 contracts still on the nearer term April, but they all been rolling into June. Into June, And you can see that 31,000 contracts were added just Thursday. So we're moving over to that June contract. So you're going to see some price rotation. And whenever you roll contracts from one month to the next, generally you have prices come down a bit as people roll them. Why? Because the big shorts complex put on by the bullion banks, they have to be able to roll those. So they want prices down. Wednesday's data, again, uh, not many deliveries. Uh, overall total deliveries were zero, uh, but you had 537,000 contracts closed. Here's that close and here's deliveries. Delivery zero, uh, 537,000 contracts for a 0% physical delivery rate on the market. Again, physical has bupkis to do with the price. Nothing, nada, zilch, zippo, nothing, 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 nothing. So all of you guys now getting interested in the precious metals for the first time, physical trade at your dealer from the miners through the supply chain has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with the price. And hopefully I'm making that abundantly clear. And the reason I'm making such a big deal is people are like, why is Rob making such a big deal about this? Because we've got so many new people coming in and they're like, what about the prices at the dealer? What about the money? No, 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 no. This is how the market works. It is a rigged market. I'm going to show you who's rigging it here in a moment. Uh, then we're just going to go over to silver. And I'm just looking at the volume in OI. We're not going to look at the price settlement. You guys know how that works. Well, actually, let's look at price settlement for the new guys. I'm going to go over to price settlement. And we're going to look at how the prices are determined. And you're going to see this is where spot prices come from. Because if we look at Thursday's data, uh, gold was trading up 24 bucks. If we look at Wednesday's data, gold was trading up a buck. I'm looking at change here in this column right here, change, this column. If I look at Tuesday, it's down $4.60. That's what determines price. It's paper that can have a 0% delivery rate or a 100,000% delivery rate, but it determines what you're paying. And I'm going to show you in a moment where you're in the golden age of gold and silver investment if you want to get into it, because I'm going to show you who's suppressing price and how they're doing it. 
And if you wait till that system is broken or they let it free, you're going to pay a hell of a lot more for your precious metal than you're paying now. All right, moving on to silver, uh, high volume, about 100 and what is that? About 130,000 uh, contracts, uh, oh, 159,000 contracts at close, 75 deliveries of 5,000 ounce silver. A fraction of the contracts, 159,000 contracts of 5,000 ounce silver traded to determine the price, but only 75 of those were delivered. What's that percentage? 100, 1,000, 1 millionth of a percent? I don't know. You do the numbers. But that's how the price is determined. May is the dominant contract for silver. Gold and silver don't have to be the same. Uh, and in May, you'll get more deliveries in silver. And in June, you'll get more deliveries in gold because if you have more contracts, you can take deliveries. But even then, we're not talking 5%, 10% delivery. We're talking fractions of a percent. And silver, you can say yesterday went down 90 something cents. Wednesday, it went down 30 cents. This is where prices are determined right here. It's contract pricing. Now, let's go on to who's doing what in the market. This is the CFTC government website you can see in the URL bar here at the top of your screen. We're looking at the COT report. This is commitment of traders. And this is always in arrears or it looks back because the data is com is compiled and it's usually about a week late and it usually is updated Friday. So actually today we'll get a new one at the end of the day. But this is through March 12th. And I'm going to point you to this chart at the bottom. This is the percent of open interest held by the number of largest traders. In other words, these are the whale in the markets and who controls the market. If you look at short, uh, eight or less traders short control 50, almost 50 percent of the short positions in one spot. Uh, just eight traders and four traders control 31 percent. So I'm going to point out that there's a lot of shorting going on in producer merchant category. This is legitimate hedging, but these guys actually manufacture, produce and use the gold or the silver. So in that case, they're hedging for legitimate hedging. If the price moves up, it hurts manufacturers because they have to pay more. So they will take a long position. So if price moves up. They can cash in on that long futures market and basically sell their contracts at a profit and offset the higher prices they're paying for the actual physical commodity. If you're a producer, a miner, and the price goes down, you're getting less for your produced commodity. And that's like bread falling a buck. And then the bread producers are like, I can't afford to produce bread with bread falling a buck. So what you do is they hedge it to the downside and say, well, I'm going to take this short contract so the price does go down. At least I can cash in this contract and recoup some of my losses. And so that's legitimate hedging. This column here is legitimate hedging, producer merchant. Everything else is speculation. Swap dealers manage money and other reportables. 99% speculation because there's enough contracts here to cover silver production for the next two to three months. The rest of this do doesn't actually cover physical production or physical use. It's covering essentially speculation on price. And you can see here the swap dealers or the bullion banks, the ones that have these big concentrated positions. We know that from the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency Report from the government because it's put there and we even know the names of the banks. They added 7,958 contracts to the short side and subtracted another 2048 from long. So now they're sitting at a higher short to long position than I've seen them sitting at in years. And what happens when you introduce a lot more short paper on the derivative market? It affects price and prices do what? They go down because that's where prices are determined right here. It's not physical trade because there is no physical trade because there's no freaking deliveries as a percentage, let's go back up here, deliveries as a percentage of contracts, 75 divided by 159,536. Okay. This is all paper and they're just dumping paper to lower the price. That's why silver went down. Silver was running. They dumped a crap ton of paper. If you multiply 7,958 contracts or you take that and you add the 2048, you get basically to 10,000 contracts, 10,000 and what is that? Six or 16. And you multiply those 10,000 contracts times 5,000 ounce silver because each contract represents 5,000 physical ounces. Even though the physical ounces are not traded, you control, quote unquote, that many. That's 10,000 contracts times 5,000 ounces. Add up how much silver they're affecting by these little contracts. And by the way, you only have to put up a little bit of margin on these contracts to control them. And the only time that you actually have to commit all of that money is if you're in a de delivery cycle or you're closing the contract position. A lot of times they just roll them over. So you can control the commodities markets, not only gold, silver, but the rest of the commodities with a very small position. This is very dangerous, but that's what happens all the time. Gold, same thing. Uh, four or less traders, concentrated short position, 33.5%. Eight or less traders, concentrated short position, 48%. Who made the biggest changes? The swap dealers right here. Ding. Uh, they added 10,000 shorts in gold and subtracted 2,000 longs for a net increase of about 12,000 short position in gold. And that's why gold price is coming down. Why? Because we can see it. 
Gold price is coming down. Why? Because they slammed it with all of that damn paper. That's how that market works. So for all of you just getting into this and trying to figure out where gold prices are going, where silver prices are going, why sugar is more expensive, why oil is more expensive, why whatever is going up or down, hog futures, this commodities market is how it's controlled. But specifically in the precious metals, sugar, oil, and a few other things, there are these large concentrated positions, not only by the producer merchants who are doing legitimate hedging, but by other interested parties, financial houses, bullion banks, things like that. But the shorting, the suppression of the precious metals, most of that comes through uh, the bullion banks. And a lot of this is trading for their own accounts. Some of it's for their client accounts. But it's done, and those concentrated positions are done by those entities, and they keep the prices down. Now, what happens when they're not able to do they more? What happens when physical demand across the world overwhelms COMEX? Well, we're seeing in the Chinese market how gold and silver are priced much higher than they are in the West. Why? Because it's a more physically delivered market. So when you do more physical deliveries and there's more demand, it, it brings the price up. Okay. So when the West is losing control, I think, of the pricing mechanism of deliveries. And I've also heard from people that are close to the industry that the COMEX is limiting deliveries of the precious metals specifically to outside parties. If they figure out that you're outside the, the U.S. or the Western Alliance of Nations and think about how who needs resources for war, think about who needs resources for what's going on in Europe and in the Middle East, they're going to limit delivery of those commodities and precious metals to those entities and they're going to try to restrict to the rest of the world. So what we're seeing is a split of the world markets in precious metals and probably other commodities as well. This is something I predicted four years ago at Metals and Miners Conference when I talked about upcoming commodity wars four years ago. And now we're seeing it blatantly come to fruition that the precious metals markets are going to break. You're going to have a West and you're going to have an East and the East is going to be priced more appropriately to what people actually want the physical for. Whereas the West, they're trying to suppress it because what happens is they want to vacuum it all up into the central banks and recapitalize the monetary system. And they don't, and they want to control price of silver so that they can have their war machine and their machine because you need silver for all that. So that's essentially, I think, what's going on. That's my opinion, of course. Do your own research. You know, don't trade off of this. Contact your financial advisors. My disclaimer always. But essentially, I mean, I think that's what's going on. And I think at, at the end of the day, uh, if you're worrying about getting into precious metals, you're thinking about now's the time. Because when those prices blow this time, the lid is going to be blown off. Gold so far has kept up with inflation, relatively speaking, since 1971. We haven't even gotten into the panic market where people rotate out of other assets and go into gold and go into silver. And then that explosion is coming. And because we've had artificial price suppression, I actually think the the amount of underlying demand and pent up demand in gold and silver is so strong. It's going to be like a volcano that explodes. It's going to be Mount Vesuvius. It's going to you know, it's going to wipe out the derivative complex here in the West. And the West is going to lose control. And I think that's going to shift east and it's going to go to the Middle East, going to go to Dubai and Shanghai and all these other markets. And I think that's pretty clear. And I think the, the those powers know that because they're setting up the Belt and Road Initiative and all of those trading agreements. And when I went to PDAC, we talked to Saudi Arabia, who's now developing their own mineral mines. They're not just relying on oil and gas and they're using their existing base of manufacturing and economy and, and uh, capitalist enterprises to fund their mining. And so the rest of the world's ramping up mining. So that mining is going to feed the Eastern markets. And, and not only are gold and silver being stolen from the West into the East, and that's why Comex is now having to supposedly limit deliveries. What I hear, that's just hearsay, but it's what I hear, that eventually a lot of those commodities are going to shift to moving over to the other markets. And once that pricing scheme is broken in the West, who knows where it's going to go? But given what's going on fundamentally and geopolitically, I think that there could be a blow off top in the commodities markets, not only gold and silver, but the rest of the commodities markets. And because we haven't invested in the front end and the supply chain for a lot of these mines and a lot of this production, uh, especially in the West where they're sequestering lands and not allowing and, and delaying permits in, in Mexico and the Western U.S. and all over the U.S., I think that that's going to affect the supply in the West of those commodities. And it's going to raise price inflation for everything that depends upon those commodities a lot more. So I think the Western world may take the brunt of actually the inflation that's coming, not only because of de-dollarization, but limiting a supply's lack of investment into the commodities complex and lack of investment in manufacturing and real things here in the United States. It's going to elongate the recovery cycle. Uh, and in big crashes in the past, it may have taken 25 years for that stock market to recover. It may take 30 or 40 this time around. Because how are we going to recover when we don't have productive capacity and we don't have access to resources and our markets are manipulated to the fact that we don't have accurate pricing on physical goods and services and we have no base with which to build? We may have to go into a wartime economy to reestablish manufacturing. And I think that's another reason why Europe is moving to a wartime economy, because 
their manufacturing base has been decimated. Their productive capacity has been decimated. And now where are they going? They're going to war. And, and war will help rebuild the European and U.S. economies, but it's going to be not in the way that we want. Look back to World War II and how that happened. That was not pleasant. A lot of people died. A lot of bad things happened. I hope that we're not going there. I'm not predicting we're going there, but I've been talking about it now for about six months, and I think it's something we need to start looking at. There is a lot of risk here, and if we end up going to regional hot wars, even to a world war, it's going to change everything. And it's not just going to be how we profit from things. It's how do we survive it. And so now we need to start having those discussions. And uh, um, well, we'll get into that later. But anyway, this is going to do it for today. Thank you guys for being patient as we move things around, get the studio updated here at the shop. Also had a lot of things happen the last couple of weeks that were, you know, with regards to our business partners and friends that caused us to refocus uh, temporarily on uh, other things that matter a lot. Um, uh, and we did that. That was the right thing to do. It was a respectful thing to do. Uh, but now we need to get back into business as usual and doing doing the show. So we'll be back next Tuesday with our next weekly market wrap. And I'll have, you know, more interviews and more interesting content for you next Thursday as well. I've done interviews on other channels. I'm going to do another mashup like we did last Thursday for some of those so that you guys can see me on other channels. Uh, I'm on other channels frequently and channels that allow, let's just put it this way, channels that allow for all the views to be accurately represented on the channel, whereas mine don't. Because I know I get more views that aren't represented because I can see them go up and then they retreat. But we'll get into that later. But in any case, I've expanded into a lot of other channels. I'm getting a lot more exposure. So I'm going to bring that back to you guys in case you're not seeing it. So that you know that our voice is out there in other places for Gold Silver Pros. And in addition, uh, next week will be the return of our silver specials and gold specials. I haven't been running specials on the program for quite some time. We've been kind of changing our business to be more competitive and to change the channels of which that we sell to better reach the public. So we'll be announcing that in the next couple of weeks, some of the changes that we made for the bullion storm for availability of precious metals. I think the changes are gonna be positive for you guys. It's gonna bring you a little bit better and more competitive pricing, but we're moving to channels that allow us to compete in the open marketplace and to continue to build uh, the Gold Silver Pros Bullion Store. So we'll talk about that next week as well. So at the same time, we're getting the studio updated, the same time we're getting our store updated, all of that's coming. Thank you guys for being patient. This is just us going through changes to be more competitive, to provide you better educational uh, content, and also to provide you better access to the precious metals that you're gonna want uh, in a way, and I think that's, that's gonna fit your budget and also your need as we get into this super cycle of precious metals that's coming up. So excited about that. We'll make some announcements on that. Thank you for sticking with the channel. This has been a really long one because, you know, this is our big video for the week. Sorry about that, guys. Stay tuned to Twitter and YouTube. I'm trying to put up more short data for you guys. If you can't sit through these 45 minute ones and we'll bring that to the channel as well. But uh, we'll go ahead and end this one here. Uh, thanks, guys, for joining the channel. This has been your weekly market wrap up. We'll return to normal programming next week. See you until the next time. See you. This is Rob Keynes at www.goldsilverpros.com. Thank you.